In the last two videos, we've been looking at iterative methods for solving elliptic partial differential equations using finite difference methods. We looked at Jacobi, gauss seidel and SOR, each of which is computationally more efficient. Before we discuss in the next video another class of iterative techniques, which is actually more elliptic-like and more faithful to the character of our elliptic governing equations, I want to discuss how boundary conditions are implemented in these iterative schemes. So if you haven't already, go back and look at the extended fin example where we had a one-dimensional boundary value problem. We had boundary conditions, Dirichlet, Neumann, Robin, and so forth, and we discussed in the one-dimensional context how those boundary conditions would be implemented. Here we're going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to be in two dimensions with natural extension to three dimensions as well. So let's look at Dirichlet boundary conditions first. Remember Dirichlet boundary conditions mean that we know the value of u at each point on the boundary. So we can simply put those in for u1, j, u capital I plus 1, j, u i1, and u i capital J plus 1. So at every point on the boundary where you know the value of u, so in heat transfer context, this would be an isothermal boundary condition, just put the temperature and put it right in the two-dimensional array for u. Then you only need to apply your Jacobi, gauss seidel or SOR iteration process to the interior points of your domain. So here I've sketched the lower left-hand corner. Here's the 1, 1 point, the lower left-hand corner, 2, 1, 1, 2, and so forth as you go through i in the x-direction and j in the y-direction. So if you look, for example, at this point 2, 2, when i is 2 and j is 2, you'll notice you have two points here and here that are on the boundary. So what happens? Well, you've already put in those boundary values into the array, and so on the right-hand side where you have those terms, it would be here i minus 1 j and here i j minus 1. Those values are known, but they're already in the array, so it just picks them up and evaluates them along with the other points here and here in your five-point finite difference stencil to get an approximation for u2,2. So Dirichlet is very straightforward. Just put the known values on the boundary, only evaluate the difference equation in the interior, and it will pick up when necessary points on the boundaries, and everything is fine. Where things get a little more difficult is if you have a Neumann or a Robin boundary condition. So let's just look at the Neumann case. So we have a derivative boundary condition. Say partial u partial x is equal to some known value c at x is equal to zero. That's the left boundary of our two-dimensional domain. This would be like the heat flux being specified in a heat transfer context. So the question is, how do we incorporate this boundary condition along with our general algorithm throughout the interior of the domain? Well, first let me show you what we don't do. So the tempting thing to do is, well, let's just apply our boundary condition at the boundary using a forward difference. So you notice this is u2j minus u1j. So if this is the boundary, then it's this point minus this point divided by the distance between them, which is delta x, and that's equal to c. I can solve for the value of u1j, the value on the boundary. That's given by this expression. Everything is known. But what you'll notice is this is only a first order approximation for the first derivative. Now you say, well, that's only for the boundary points. The interior points are still second order accurate, so what's the problem? The problem is basically everything reverts to the lowest common denominator. So you want the order of the approximations in terms of the truncation error to be consistent throughout your domain. So if you're using second order accurate finite differences for the interior, you want to use second order accurate central differences for the boundaries as well. So let's show how to do that. First, let's start by applying our finite difference equation. Just say Jacobi for now so that we don't have to think about n and n plus ones. So this is the Jacobi equation applied on the left boundary, the boundary where we have this Neumann boundary condition. The governing equation applies everywhere throughout the domain, including the boundaries. So let's just apply it right at the boundary. But you'll notice we have this point. Here's the boundary, u0j. That's a point outside the domain, which remember we had that same situation when we developed the Thomas algorithm for the tridiagonal problem associated with the extended fin example. And here we're going to treat it exactly the same way. So I've highlighted in red this problem point. Some people call it a ghost point. So I need to eliminate this from this expression for u1j. The way we do that is we take our differential equation. We now use a second order accurate central difference approximation for the partial u partial x derivative. That's what you see right here. 
So it's u2j minus u0j divided by 2 delta x. So this point minus this point divided by the distance between them. It is now second order accurate instead of first order accurate. But you'll notice it again involves this point that's outside the domain. So if we solve this expression for that value, u0j, we get an expression which we can then substitute back into here to eliminate the u0j in our difference equation. And that's exactly what we do. So what we get is the following. So this is our equation for u1j. So we're going to increment through the j's where the i is equal to 1. So this is along the left boundary for all j. And we now have an expression where we know everything on the right-hand side. We've eliminated the point outside the domain, so we know everything on the right-hand side, and we can evaluate that. So the only additional step as compared to the Dirichlet condition case is we have the same equation for the interior of the domain, but now we have an additional sweep along the left boundary using this equation. And that's it. You can easily adapt this for the Robin boundary condition, which was the case that we had in the extended fin example with, with essentially no difference in how it's done. Now what would happen if we also had a Neumann boundary condition along the top? So along the top boundary, if we had partial u partial y is equal to some known constant d, then how do we do that? Well, it's just more of the same. You take the equation that we developed for i is equal to 1 on the previous slide, you apply it at the upper left-hand corner when i is 1 and little j is capital J plus 1. That's going to involve this point outside the domain. You again use a second order accurate central difference approximation on the boundary condition, solve for that point outside the domain, and substitute it back in and eliminate it in your general equation. So you can see for every boundary and for corner points, you'll get different equations if you have non Dirichlet boundary conditions. But it's just more of the same. And you can see those d details here. So here's the second order accurate central difference approximation for that y derivative, solve for the point outside the domain, substitute it back into our difference equation, and get this expression that applies at 